Yeah, it's also nice to have a couple of people who are coming for the first time to sit with a group. Uh, and hopefully to just take in some of that supportive energy that a group of practitioners can offer. And I agree with this idea of sitting in a circle, you know, it's very friendly. We're all sort of part of the same circle. No one's kind of on a higher platform. No one's on the floor. So it feels very friendly and uh, hopefully like a, a safe and reasonably non-judgmental space so we can bring those feelings inside our hearts as well. So I thought we could start with a meditation maybe for... Ooh, we're already quarter past seven, so maybe 20, 25 minutes, and then have a Dhamma reflection. And today's theme is on an open heart of patience, uh, which I know I can <laughs> certainly keep developing, and I'm sure that stands for everybody here. Uh, and then we can have some time for question and answers, or discussion, or just sharing together, and learning from each other at the end, so... So if you would like to make yourselves as comfortable as you can, and sometimes that just involves feeling our body and asking our bodies what they need at this time. It might be the toilet <laughs> to your right. <laughs> to cough, to take your shoes off, to change your posture. Lean back or maybe straighten up. There's no right or wrong way. So whatever's comfortable for you is the best posture at this time. And it can help coming in contact with the body by closing our eyes. So that we allow the senses to start quietening and turning inward. Moving from the world of sights and sounds, tastes, smells, into the feeling realm. feeling part of the mind. And really allowing yourself time to arrive, to land in your body. Not to rush this part of the practice. but to establish that connection with the feelings in the body and to do that in a friendly way as if you are meeting a friend who you wish to get to know, to listen to, to feel, to sense. So what would it take to really give your body the feeling that it can be at ease? That your body is in the friendly presence of your mind.
Sometimes it can help to breathe in a little more deeply. And let the body relax with a slightly longer out breath. Allowing the body to sink into the chair. Your feet. To just feel that connection with the ground. And perhaps to gently widen the sphere of your awareness so that your mind can sense into the whole body and even the space around your body. The friendly, welcoming environment of so many spiritual friends. Just receiving any sensations that arise. Allowing tensions or knots their own time to unwind. Simply by giving them space. allowing them to be. And listening, listening deeply with curiosity to what's going on right now in your body and mind. Just being a companion to your experience.
perhaps tending to your experience the way a loving, patient mother would tend to her child. Sometimes the child needs to feel held, for the mother to be close. Other times she can give the child a little more space. The mother doesn't make demands on the child, but is just there quietly, allowing the child to feel safe and at ease. So in the same way, we can allow our body and mind to be without judgment or pressure, without control, just tending to this moment with a patient and spacious, open heart.
Sometimes as the mind settles and feels relaxed, you may find you naturally become aware of the breathing. If the breath comes to your mind, see if you can hold it very lightly, gently, allowing the breath to fill the mind. Whether it's the breath or a particular sensation or emotion in your mind that needs your attention, the most important thing is just to be gentle and kind. No demands, just letting things be. Patiently allowing the nature of this moment to unfold. And as we come close to the end of this meditation, 
Maybe take a few moments to just wish yourself well. Simple wishes for your well-being and ease, your happiness, safety and health. The way a mother would wish these things for her child. May I be happy. May I be safe. May I be healthy. May I be at peace. Just enjoying receiving these wishes. These wishes of genuine loving kindness. and sharing these wishes with everyone in the room. May we all be happy, healthy, and safe. May we be so patient and forgiving of ourselves and each other. May we all be at peace. Really imagining these wishes as real possibilities for everyone here. And noticing if there is that little bit more peace and ease in your heart. How does that feel? So you're very welcome to stay with these feelings inside with your eyes closed or see if you can stay connected to that sense of well-wishing for yourself even as you open your eyes.
Okay. <laughs> Sometimes I find it amazing that just by stopping for a while, there is that sense of increased peace and ease. And even if that's not the case for you right now, you've given yourself the opportunity. So that's an act of loving kindness in itself. Uh, thank you for the space. I enjoyed that. <laughs> it's the end of the week for me, so... Uh, Today I have to be patient with feeling tired. So I wanted to talk today about the open heart of patience because you need a title. <laughs> but it's really a lovely theme because the Buddha said that uh, patience is one of the most important, if not the most important of the spiritual qualities on the path. So I wanted to talk about the significance of that, of that statement. And uh, in the suttas, in the early Buddhist teachings, he says, kanti paramam tapo titika, which means something like patience is the highest austerity, tapo, which in ancient India meant some kind of burning away of defilements, some kind of really severe practices that we do to kind of, uh, uh, it's almost like penances that are kind of the fast track to awakening. So for example, even today in India, people will do these kind of austerities, these tapas, practices of tapas, like standing on one leg or standing with the legs twisted together and one arm in the air. And uh, I saw a picture of one of these ascetics once and their muscle had grown enormous around here because they stand for months and months and the hand was in the air and the fingernails were long and twisted. <laughs> And you thought, goodness me, this is, this is extreme. But in, in ancient India and even today, you know, we can laugh at this, right? But even today, how much of the time are we actually practicing austerities? And that might be a strange thing to sort of say in the Western world, which is so comfortable and we have our homes made just as we like, comfortable and cozy with flowers and plants. But actually, we're often pushing ourselves that little too hard. You know, we feel like we shouldn't sleep too much or, you know, we're hungry, but we'd better just resist the last morsel, even though our stomach hurts. Or we just push ourselves that bit too far at work. You know, you could leave the, the office hours over, but you think, well, there's a bit more to do. And there's always a bit more to do. It's, there's never an end to that. And I know that for myself with a project like the one I do, because there's never really a final now it's finished point. So we do engage in this idea of austerity quite a lot. And of course, the Buddha said that's one of the extremes. And so when he said that patience is actually the highest austerity, if you like, the highest spiritual quality, he was really redefining that term tapas to be something much more gentle, much more spacious and forgiving, much less intense and yet steady and consistent and something that can hold the whole process of this path. So I think patience is something that enables the qualities that the Buddha encourages us to develop, to develop in their own time and to come to fulfillment because sometimes we're so anxious to see the results right now. You know, and it does take time, and each quality we develop conditions the next. So patience is never a standalone quality. It's something that feeds into everything else. And one aspect of patience that I was trying to sort of bring up in the meditation was loving kindness. You know, because patience is loving, it is nurturing, and it gives the qualities in our hearts a chance to grow. Uh, it's, it's, I was thinking earlier, like how patience kind of interacts with those qualities like loving kindness, compassion, and all these things that the Buddha said are the right intentions on the path, metta, uh, compassion or non-cruelty, and also letting things be, letting things uh, be just the way they are. And patience is an aspect of that. It's a, the aspect of gentleness, not trying to force or rush things through. And one example came to me of when we're practicing loving kindness meditation. So with loving kindness, we often use a phrase such as, may I be happy. 
And I kind of think of that as like planting a seed, you know, it's just a thought, it's just an intention. But we take that very beautiful intention, that very wholesome seed, and we kind of plant it in the soil of our heart. So we say the word, may I be happy. But then we kind of have this attitude of loving kindness that waits. And that loving kindness is kind of like the sunshine on a seed. Yeah. And maybe in loving kindness as well, we bring up the idea of a person, a being who we want to share loving kindness with. So we have this person in front of us and we bring up their face, for example, or a sense of their presence. And that's like the rain, you know, that nourishes and, and helps this seed to fertilize. But the patience, you could see the patience almost as the space that holds the whole thing. It's almost like the open sky that just waits and allows this whole process to take its own course, to take its own time. So we plant the seed, we say, for example, may I be happy, may I be well. And then mindfulness is there, and it's a mindfulness that's filled with kindness, that's aware of the reverberation of that phrase in the mind or in the heart. And then that patience is just listening in, just giving it space as wide as the sky. You know, not making a demand that may the emotion of loving kindness arise, but just giving things time, letting things be. And I like that idea of expansiveness, you know, this idea of patience as um, giving things their own time, because actually it's an illusion to think that we can do anything else. You know, there's this sense of self that keeps coming in time and again when we meditate or in our lives that feels that we can kind of hurry things up, we can manipulate life to be just the way we want it to be. And this really reinforces that sense of self, which is actually rather an illusion. And I think one of the ways that patients can help us overcome and see through that is by understanding that all we really can do is try to bring about the causes and conditions um, somebody said in the car to me, it was Nick actually today, that um, the most important thing in our life, in a sense, is nurturing what we have. So we try to create fertile ground for wholesome qualities to arise. There's this phrase, you know, the survival of the fittest. But he was saying uh, in psychology that's been changed to be survival of the nurtured. And I thought that was so beautiful, you know, it kind of takes us away from having to run the marathon of life and more kind of look at the ground we're actually walking on. Is it, is it going to be conducive to achieving our aim? And of course, in the spiritual life, the aim is much less of gaining and acquiring and hoarding, and, you know, having um, material success and more this sense of letting things be simplifying, giving up sensual desire to incline the mind to a more beautiful sense of inner peace. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, obstacles to patience, maybe what the antithesis to patience could be. And the obvious thing there is this kind of sense of irritation, right, when we don't get our desires met. And I think often that is where patience is most helpful. You know, in our society, in our, the way we're conditioned, we're kind of taught that the more the better, you know, and it's not only about satisfying our desires, but satisfying them now. You know, this idea of instant gratification. And uh, there's this lovely phrase, I think, from, uh, in, from uh, the Middle East, and they make curses on people. They've got these two curses, right? One of them is uh, really cool. It's May the, uh, the fleas of a thousand camels infest your armpits. <laughs> Which is really nasty, isn't it, and mean, but very graphic. <laughs> so you say this to someone you don't like. But the other one, which is considered even worse than that, is may you get whatever you want as soon as you want it. Yeah. <laughs> and this is the worst curse you can get. And, you know, not only is it obvious kind of why almost viscerally, but also in the Buddhist sense, I think, although we have the goals of purifying the heart, the path is much more important. It's how we walk the path rather than what we get out of it, if you like. So it's really how we, uh, we relate to our practice and how much loving kindness, how much patience, how much 
um, compassion we bring to our lives, we bring to our practice. This is really where success lies, and it's quite the opposite, isn't it, of uh, attaining and acquiring and getting things now. Because if you get things now, I mean, where's the opportunity to give? Where's the opportunity to share, to serve, to allow things to, to grow in their own time and to enjoy the beauty of that? So obviously, um, one of the uh, opposites of, Im of patience is impatience, this kind of very irritable, brittle sense of, uh, things kind of wanting to sort things out. And uh, I also was thinking that one of the uh, challenges to patients is mobile phones, mm -hmm. at least in my world. <laughs> you know, not only don't they work often, but sometimes they kind of crash just as you're about to make a payment for a train ticket or something like that. But this other thing about mobile phones is that we always expect people's answer right now. You know, you send them a message and you say, I'm nearly there. You know, I'm coming, it's like, I'm three minutes late. And then your friend doesn't reply and you're like, huh, they didn't reply, like one minute I sent the text message and they still haven't replied. And then, you know, you get a little bit later, so you're like, oh, now it's gonna be four minutes. <laughs> and you have to tell your friend every step of the way, you know, because we don't have patience to just wait and see what's gonna happen the other end. And I don't know, I remember those times I was traveling in Asia and I hadn't a clue whether the train would come. There was one time I was traveling even in Holland and um, I was on the train without a phone, without any kind of backup plan. I didn't even have the place of the, uh, the center that I was going to at the other end. I think it was a train to Germany, but halfway through in Holland, the crew got off and we had to wait for the next crew to get on and they were late, one or two hours. And then they got on and they were like, great, we've got good news, the crew just arrived. But the bad news is they now have to have their lunch so they got on the plane, on the train, but now they had to have their meal. So that was another hour and we continued. And of course, I'd missed more than one connection by then. And I had no idea whether my friends would be at the other end to pick me up. And as a, as a nun, you don't use money. You know, I didn't have a phone. I couldn't make a phone call. I didn't even have the address or a computer to find it. And I just had to trust. I just had to trust that, well, there's nothing I can do in this situation. The only thing to do is be patient and wait where I am now. Stop thinking about when I'm gonna get there and who's gonna be there and hope that something happens. So when I got there, I was very happy to see that of course they were all meditators and they'd been waiting on the station for quite a long time. Mm. But you know, there was none of this. If I would have had to text them and say, oh, it's a bit late, I don't know. They might've thought, well, we'll just give up. You know, She didn't answer for the last five minutes. She's not coming anymore. So we kind of get very, short fused and, and little capacity to wait. And I think this is such a problem, isn't it? The other thing that's sometimes mistaken for patience and uh, in the Buddhist tradition, we have this idea of near and far enemies. So the far enemy of patience would of course be kind of anger and irritation, impatience, frustration. But the near enemy, and I'm making this up because it's not in the suttas, is something like tolerance. I feel that tolerance is a very shabby and poor substitute for patience. Because tolerance sounds to me a little bit like gritting your teeth. I'll kind of stay with you as long as you change. I'll tolerate you as long as you stay over there. And someone actually said that. I actually heard from some monks in this country, or monk, singular. They said, oh, it's okay if she has a, a bikuni monastery as long as it's further from us. <laughs> this doesn't represent all monks and there's many people who are very supportive of what we do, but it's that idea of we can tolerate the other as long as we don't, they don't come too close, you know. And for me, that's almost the opposite actually of patience because patience to me is being present, really being present, open, and with our experience right now, waiting with it, rather than waiting for it to change, waiting for it to go away, you know, waiting even for it to, to develop. Because the waiting for it to develop is a kind of craving. It's a subtle kind of pressure that we put on our experience and on our mind and our heart. I heard actually recently that uh, 
Sometimes people throw their orchids away because after they bloom for the first time, they think that's it. <laughs> they think the orchid's finished. So instead of that, you know, they, um, they just put it in the bin. And I've had a beautiful orchid now for about four years. My dad had one for eight years, so I'm taking inspiration from him. But I wondered too, you know, when the, the first kind of flower stem finished flowering and, uh, and all the flowers fell off. And sometimes the flower stems also become a little bit dry um, and you think that's it, you know. But someone said to me, well, you know, the green leaves are still really nice. At least it's some greenery. So I thought, yeah, that's right. And all I need to do is soak it in water for 15 minutes a week. So I'll just soak it in water for 15 minutes and enjoy the greenery while it's there. And lo and behold, a few months later, the next flower stems came out and beautiful flowers came again. And I've been continuing that process now for, like I say, four years. And uh, it even had whole new stems at one point, not just a new flower shoot, but a whole new set of stems. And again, we have beautiful orchids in the monastery. And I think this is the thing, isn't it? If we don't have that patience, if we're looking for something to happen now, and we also don't have the trust. I think trust is a part of patience. Trust that things will happen in their own time, so long as we keep giving them the opportunity by watering that plant, you know, by soaking the roots. Then we really miss out on so many flowers that can happen, you know, so much flourishing that can develop in our mind. But we really have to give these things time and enjoy the process, right? Patience also has a cause. You know, it doesn't come out of nowhere. In, Buddhist, in the Buddha's teaching, everything is about causality. You could say this is one of the major themes running through. And causality is very close to the understanding of non-self because there is nothing inherent in a person or in our mind. You know, we don't have fixed qualities that are either there or not. It's all an aspect of cultivation and making sure the conditions are in place or putting ourselves sometimes in fertile ground. For example, coming here to the Quaker Meeting House and having this lovely holding space where I certainly started to feel some energy. I don't know about others. Towards the end of that meditation, I started to feel this sense of joy that everybody's well-intentioned, that everybody's just holding space for one another and it's giving this sense of metta a chance to arise in the heart. So patience too has its causes. And of course, in order to have patience for the spiritual path, we have to make a start. And the Buddha says the first step in the path is basically the spiritual friendship, which enables us to hear the teachings. Yeah. Sometimes for many people, this is coming to a group like this and hearing something of the Dhamma, one aspect of the Dhamma that maybe resonates for you and makes you think, yeah, this is something worth pursuing. Sometimes it's reading the suttas or it's reading a Dhamma book by a contemporary teacher. You read something that just seems to speak to where you are. You know, and this is the start. We hear the teachings and something arises. It's called confidence. It's the flourishing of faith in the heart. You know, the sense that this is something that may be worth trying. And sometimes that's just taking the first step to come to a group or to listen to a talk online or to even just take a few minutes for yourself to be with your body and mind, you know, to see if you can sense the breath coming in and out and to see if you can find some peace with that or even just that moment where you give yourself a gift, the gift of space whereby you can relax a little bit. So it starts with this hearing the teachings and then having that confidence arise in the heart. And I always think confidence comes with a sense of inspiration if it's really going to manifest in, in, uh, in starting the path. And for me, one of the inspirations is realizing that, you know, my actions do have consequences. So there's that inspiration to really commit to a virtuous life, to trying to cultivate goodness because I know it's beneficial for me and for everyone I'm around. So that confidence gives me the feeling that it's worth training the mind. And the Buddha said it can be done. You know, he said that he wouldn't teach the way he does if it wasn't possible to awaken. And this holds for absolutely everybody. You know, nobody barred, except <laughs> if you've done something really terrible, like kill your mother or father, or draw the blood from a Buddha, which I doubt anybody here has done. <laughs> 
And even then, you get another chance, especially if you believe in rebirth. But even if you don't, you will in your next life, as my teacher sometimes says. And you will get another chance at some point. So, you know, everybody has the opportunity. You know, it's just whether we take it and how much time we give these things to, to really um, start to develop. So we plant the seeds and we try to create the fertile soil for them to flourish. And another aspect of patience, of course, is, um, is the wisdom to understand that, you know, we do need to stay with experience long enough for the Dhamma to reveal itself. So it's that wisdom that allows patience to, well, that goes hand in hand with patience. And in a way, that wisdom is the patience. You know, because when we are able to stay present, the Dhamma starts to reveal itself and we start to see that there's nobody here, that everything is arising and passing away. You know, there's nothing permanent in the human body or mind. There's nothing permanent in the realm of emotions. They just arise and pass away. And not only that they do arise and pass away, but they are conditioned. It's the how they arise and pass. That's also a part of that wisdom. So without patience, we're going to miss the process. And patience is also related to equanimity. My early practice for about 14 years <laughs> was the practice of vipassana meditation that was very much connected to observing the sensations in the body, manifesting and sometimes with pleasure, sometimes with a lot of aches and pains. And starting to go a little bit deeper than the apparent truth of, you know, this is a pain, I don't like it, and the reaction that is combined with that, to the actual nature of what was arising. And have a look at it in its component parts. So you would see that through that pain was some heat, or maybe some pulsing, some throbbing, uh, maybe sharpness, maybe tension, tightness. And getting really interested in that and starting to notice that these different feelings were kind of uh, constantly shifting, constantly changing in their intensity, in their shape, in their form. Sometimes they'd be very localized, sometimes they'd go up the leg or, you know, down into the ankle. And just that ability to stand back, you know, to hold the space with this spacious, open mind of equanimity and patience was enough to allow things the time to change and to really start to, it was almost like once the, the patience was there and the equanimity was there, mindfulness really started to grow and things started to change more rapidly to the point that it was hard to pinpoint anything as pain or even anything as pleasure for that matter. <laughs> things were just shifting all the time. And of course, when you realize that things are shifting so quickly, you also start to realize the mind is shifting with them, right? The mind has to keep track, um, to keep up to speed. So even this mind is, is, you know, changing all the time and cannot be anything permanent or fixed. So I found this kind of practice very conducive to developing patience and the kind of patience that really is a companion to the process not the patience that wants to be anywhere else. And it's amazing when you can have that patience. The pain simply doesn't appear as pain anymore. You know, it's just a privilege to be there and to learn. And I think this is another aspect of patience. Patience listens deeply to life. You know, patience can really give things space and we can do this in our daily lives with each other, right? I mean, especially if you're going through something difficult and you have a friend who's willing to talk for five minutes, but, you know, the process takes longer than that. Or sometimes I think this is one of the issues, isn't it, for people who maybe um, have psychological support and you have your session with the psychologist and it's coming to the end of your session and time's up, you know. Has, have you been fully heard? And what do you do at the end of that, you know? Can you hold the space for yourself or do you feel like you've been cut off? A process hasn't quite been seen through. With my project in Oxford, it's been a, a huge lesson in patience because it did take, uh, it has taken so far eight years to get to this point. And um, if I was only focused on outcome, it would have been a really miserable time. 
But I think one of the things that helped me was this understanding of um, what the Buddha says, an aspect of mindfulness, atapi sampajanyo satima, atapi sampajana, I think, satima. And it's from the Satipatthana Sutta. It basically means uh, being diligent, being patient, atapi, again, tapas, this austerity, this patience, giving things time. And sampajanya means like uh, knowing the purpose of what you're doing. And then satima is like the mindfulness. So we, in all our undertakings, we practice this mindfulness, but we have to know the purpose of what we're doing, the context, you know, allowing things to happen in their own time, but also the right context for things to happen. And the first time I realized something was amiss with this was um, in Burma where I was practicing for long retreats and people would be practicing what they thought was mindfulness and what they thought was sampajanya, you know, kind of uh, understanding the purpose of what they were doing. But then you'd have a conversation with someone who was also spending a lot of time in meditation and you'd start to feel that they weren't really present with you. They were kind of trying to watch their breath at the same time, <laughs> you know, and you were trying to have a conversation. It's like the time to talk, not the time to meditate. But they were like kind of resenting the fact that they had to break into speech because they had to protect their silence. And the only way they understood what mindfulness was, was close your eyes and be aware of the breath or be aware of the sensations and anything else is a distraction to that. And I realized that that wasn't understanding the context properly, wasn't really understanding the purpose of speech. And speech conversation is an opportunity to be with another, to try to understand another, and you know, to relate in a wholesome way. Right speech is part of the path, you know, and it's an opportunity to practice loving kindness and compassion and to, to really lend an ear for as long as the person needs you there. And of course, to the best of your own capacity, respecting that sometimes, you know, it isn't the right time. And maybe you do have to explain that in a very gentle and respectful way. So with the project as well, you know, I time and again have to return to the purpose of what we're doing because sometimes it's so easy and I'm sure it's the same for everyone here in their daily lives, in their livelihoods, that uh, you know, sometimes we lose track of why we're doing what we're doing and also of the value of how we serve. You know, and we just get inundated with the workload and start to feel grumpy, start to feel stressed. It happens to me, as anyone who stayed with me will know. You know, I've had a bad night, I haven't slept enough, and they're like, I have a rest for an hour and I get another 20 emails, you know, <laughs> just as I think I've cleared my head. Uh, and if we lose perspective, if we don't have this sense of the purpose of what we're doing, you know, in this case, to develop conditions for people to practice, for people to develop good qualities, and including myself, then it will be very difficult to sustain. And we will fall into irritation and impatience with the process, simply because we've forgotten the longer term goal, you know, and... Uh, a really lovely thing that happened as a wonderful example of patience the other day um, was that a friend of ours came to visit the Vihara and they said that uh, their whole life at the moment is involved with caring for their husband who has, uh, I guess, sort of final stages of Parkinson's disease and also accompanied by dementia at this point. Um, and they were able to reflect on their relationship with their husband over at least 40 years, I think, um, and reflect on all the times they had been impatient with this person because they didn't understand their language. They didn't understand the way they express love. And sometimes we're looking for certain ways that others relate to us. We want them to say the right thing or show their love through um, sensitive words. But she said, oh, it took me a while to realize that his love language was actually to give, to provide you know, to, to support me and to offer that um, security in my life. And I wish in retrospect I'd been more patient because now I can understand that, you know, that there's something beautiful there. But when we have our expectation, our demand, sometimes we're missing what is there. 
And the other really powerful um, teaching she gave to us just the other day was, uh, she said a test of her practice. She went to his bed that morning and he didn't wake up, you know. She's been living with this uncertainty for so long of how things are going to go and what's going to happen when he does die. How is she going to respond? Will her practice kick in, you know? The practice of so many years. And she said uh, she saw him there and realized that he may or may not wake up. And she felt okay with that. She felt she could wait and give it time. So she phoned the nurse and asked about it, and they said, yeah, you know, just wait and see. And she said, yeah, okay, I can do that. I can just wait. And she did that, patiently waiting with loving kindness. And after two or three hours, he, he awoke. And he said something quite funny, actually. He said, who are you? <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> In her own home. So she had a laugh. It was, it was, <laughs> she could see the light side. But what she realized is that, yeah, she could have panicked there, you know. She could have phoned the hospital. They could have come along with an ambulance and taken him off. Maybe he had died, but she gave it time. She waited with patience for him to awake. And the process is continuing day by day. A process of great uncertainty, but a lot of spaciousness around it, a lot of patience and giving things time. So I don't know how patience manifests for you in your life, but it'd be really lovely to hear from other people about this and about ways we can be patient with even the more difficult things in life. Yeah, so this is something of what I hope to offer today, and um, it would be lovely to hear anybody's thoughts and reflections on the theme or on anything else that you're working with now. Ha, 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 ha.